Uh, you're watching an interview with the Oxford Political Review. I'm Brian Wong, the founding editor in chief of the Review, and I'm joined by Nicholas Lear, a managing editor. We're honoured to welcome today Professor Yanis Varoufakis, the former Minister of Finance of Greece, a leading economist, writer, academic, and philosopher, and member of Parliament in Greece, and the author of several highly acclaimed books. Professor Varoufakis, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I just want to start this interview by asking you about the COVID-19 situation. And on note of COVID, many have tooted COVID-19 to be an indictment of the worst consequences of social economic inequality, particularly in otherwise so-called advanced liberal democracies. Yet we've also seen shifts towards more progressive policies that are if you will, perhaps inspired or triggered by COVID-19, whether it be Spain's universal basic income or the Conservative Party's seeming pivot towards upping unemployment benefits and ensuring a more robust base salary, perhaps, for workers on precarious arrangements. So do you think the prognosis is all that grim? And if so, where do you think we're going from here? Well, things are not looking very good, but let's not... Uh paint uh, a bleak picture um, instead of uh, using common sense and rationality in order to dissect the present moment in history. Look, um, this is not a crisis like anything else we've seen, not so much because of its magnitude, but because of its quality. Um, humanity, you know, I mean, we're animals. We are prone to being attacked by viruses. Uh, this has nothing to do with our socioeconomic system. The way in which COVID-19 has, however, reacted or actually collided with existing, pre-existing problems, that's what's at issue. Uh, let me take you to a day um, of this month, the month that is dying out today. In particular, let's go to the 12th of August. I believe that historians, especially economic historians, are going to mark the day as uh, particularly significant. You may recall that um, on, in the morning, just after nine o'clock of the 12th of August, we had a remarkable phenomenon. Uh, the news came out that the United Kingdom economy had um, hit rock, rock bottom, that it was experiencing the West slump in, in its history, maybe you know, for, ever. <laughs> ever. Um, but certainly during the last century, there's never been a slump of more than 20% of GDP over the first seven months of any year. Uh, okay, well, that's perfectly understandable. We had lockdown, we had all that. What is not understandable is that 25 minutes later, after the official announcement of the worst slump in the history of British capitalism, the London Stock Exchange jumped by 2%. While in New York City, on the very same day, uh, Wall Street, uh, the, uh, the S&P 500, reached its climax. It's historic record. At the time, we know that the United States economy is in the doldrums, to say the least, and the United States is um, <laughs> experiencing a very serious danger of being a failed state. Um, now, that needs to be analyzed. Some, this is remarkable. Uh, it's not that uh, upon hearing that uh, uh, Britain's economy has tanked, um, animal spirits were ignited and people think, oh yes, but things are going to go well and this is why they were blind. No, things are far, far worse than that. Finances actually don't give a damn anymore about the state of the economy. You only need to state that to realize what kind of trouble we're in. Uh, we have a complete decoupling of the financial sector from uh, the economy. Now, why is this relevant to, to your pertinent question about what should government do? Because it is a mistake to think in terms of fiscal policy, monetary policy, even social policy, mm. um, as if this is a normal crisis, only one that is larger in quantity terms. This is not a normal crisis. To put it slightly more provocative, if you want, one of the great problems we have is that the crisis is not uniform. The financial markets are doing very, very well. Oligopolies like, um, or monopolies like Facebook or Amazon, they've never done better. Uh, so, when you, in a sense, in order to uh, arrest the free fall of the real economy, we need to puncture the, 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 the bubble from which so many people make so much money. 
they're a minority, a small minority, but they're not 10 people, you know, they're, th they're thousands. And they're making a huge amount of money. Now, those people are extremely powerful and their interests will have to suffer before we can do something to stabilize our social economies. Um, so, you know, let's begin with that and then have a discussion about what needs to be done uh, in order to create circumstances that will expand the prospects of the vast majority of people out there who are seriously suffering and, and for whom the suffering seems to have no end. That's very interesting because I think the, the issue of inequalities are, are, don't just occur on a domestic level, but there's also a global dimension distinctly to it. And in particular, there are victims, of course, or to some extent or another, workers could be victims of international conflicts, both in hot forms and also in cold forms, such as, for instance, an allegedly impeding US-China Cold War. Now, on that subject, I wanted to ask if you thought that this new Cold War, for some experts, is likely to occur, or do you think it's just overblown hysteria about a natural decoupling between the two largest economies uh, of the world? Uh, and as a follow-up, I suppose, how do you think November, if at all, may change things up or shake things up, should Biden be elected instead of Trump's re-election, re in that sense? Well, the quick answer is that um, the uh, expectation that a Biden victory is going to change things significantly is overdone. It's uh, over-exaggerated. Uh, Trump has changed international politics, especially the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world, in ways that uh, in many um, senses uh, are irreversible. From my perspective, what's happening between the United States and China is um, a culmination, I wouldn't call it of the building up of inequalities, but allow me an old fashioned leftist expression, the culmination of a class war within China and another class war within the United States. Let's begin with China and then move to, to the United States. Um, without it wanting to criticize the Chinese government, uh, I'm just going to um, put down, uh, so to speak, the basic characteristics of Chinese growth over the last 20 years. Uh, there's been a remarkable level of public investment, uh, especially after 2008, uh, which replaced the lost uh, export income after the financial sector collapse in 2008 in the West, in the North Atlantic in particular. Uh, and we've reached a situation where the levels of public investment in China, which have been responsible for the floating capitalism globally, let's be honest about that, you know, American capitalism, British capitalism would not have survived without the huge growth in public investment in China. But nevertheless, that meant, um, it's, it's a truth of geometry, if you want, uh, a tautology of economics, that um, um, working class incomes shrunk as a percentage of um, national income in China. Uh, so you have um, gigantic growth. At the same time, you have um, uh, an increase in the wealth of the very, very few in China. Uh, you have speculation um, giving rise to very large rents, economic rents, for the very few in China. Uh, and therefore, an economic model which is based on a relationship with the United States where so that China can sustain global capitalism, the United States in particular, China must be the one that effectively buys into the increasing public debt of America. And at the same time, that it is the workshop of companies like Apple um, so that um, uh, this thing holds together. At the very same time, the United States, after 2008, and in the European Union, but let's stick to the United States for the, for the time being, uh, what we had was, following the, the implosion of Wall Street, you had um, um, a kind of socialism for the financiers. So you had majestic money minting on behalf of the Fed. Um, if you look at all the varieties of the monies that were printed 
on behalf of the financiers. It, it exceeds $10 trillion since 2008. Uh, while the many, the people in, um, um, you know, in, <laughs> inhabiting Main Street, as the Americans say, experience austerity, very harsh austerity. Because, you know, you may have heard ab about Obama's um, stimulus program. Um, it wasn't real in the sense that, yes, there was a stimulus program, while at the same time the state governments were cutting down. So if you add federal and state together, you have austerity in the United States. So the many, in the majority, were suffering austerity, while the finances and the corporations were effectively being drip-fed gigantic quantities of liquidity, right? So you've got um, an, a decoupling of finance, of asset price inflation from price inflation from incomes. So if you put these two pictures together, what's be, what I call the class war in China and the class war in the United States, you have the makings of trade that is as a symptom, it is becoming imbalanced or it, a, a balance of payments situation, which is becoming imbalanced. Okay, so Trump, Trump come, comes along and through his own weird uh, thinking, um, picks up one important strand, maybe completely independently from his own thinking, because you know this, people like Trump sometimes have the capacity to feel that something is happening without even, even understanding it. Um, and and the one thing that he got was that if this process continues, the United States output is going to fall below eight percent of global output. And then the question becomes, how can the United States remain hegemonic in a world where it is an insignificant producer? And the answer that he, he came up with, which I'm absolutely convinced, is an answer that Joe Biden is going to embrace if, even if he becomes president, is that multilateralism um, is going to kill off American hegemony. Because if you, are, if you have a multilateral setting, you know, the G20, the IMF, the World Trade Organization, and you are one of many, and you are shrinking as a proportion of total GDP, then at some point your power is going to shrink. And even the, the um, incredible power of the dollar, the exorbitant privilege of the dollar is going to wane. So he looks across the Pacific and across the Atlantic, and he says, okay, so I'm going to blow up every multilateral organization, and I, I'm going to have bilateral relations. And the model in his head of the world now becomes that of a bicycle wheel, where the United States is a hub of the wheel, and every other country is a spoke. And the hub is always more powerful than any particular spoke. So you have class war on the one hand, you have the need by uh, the most powerful elites in the United States to maintain their hegemony. You can understand that every hegemon wants to maintain their hegemony. Um, and then you have the huge wars between China and the European Union, China and uh, South Korea, sorry, China, the United States and the European Union, the United States and South Korea, the United States and China. Um, now, you add to that COVID-19's colliding collision with the huge bubble that our central banks have created in order to refloat re 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 finance, and you have an existentialist crisis for global capitalism. And it's interesting you brought up hegemony because I guess a slight pushback I have here, Pro Professor, is I think you're right that it, the incentives on the part of America to preserve and retain its hegemony are there, but there are also certainly incentives on the part of China, in my opinion, to assert both an ideological and at least a regional hegemony, even though certainly I don't think it's an international vision to become a new global power that supersedes America. And on that subject, um, alongside Brexit, which I think Nick would talk about very quickly, I wanted to peek your thoughts on, do you think this reading of China as an aspiring global power is overblown, or do you think it's instead got pertinent relevance to reality to some extent, or resembles reality? You know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there's no doubt that the more powerful China becomes, uh, the greater the danger that its leadership will want to project uh, hegemony globally. But having said that, I haven't seen any signs of that so far. 
What I do see is a China that wants to establish the safety of its supply chains, the safety of its uh, trade um, um, roads and routes, the new Silk Road and so on, uh, that it wants to um, be reliant on soft power. I've not seen the Chinese in any jurisdiction try to undermine governments, overthrow governments, do what the CIA has been doing since you know, time immemorial in this country too, in Greece. Um, and therefore, there seems to be a self-restraint coming from Beijing that we need to appreciate. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, let me put it this way. I don't think there is any government, any country I know of, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United States for that matter, that would be so self-restrained when it comes to exercising the power that they have. Professor Ravakis, I wanted to join the discussion at this point and uh, ask you about uh, another elephant in the room, which has just been mentioned. It's certainly in the UK context, of course, and, and that is Brexit. Um, you have negotiated with the European Union yourself, um, of course, and written about that uh, in a scathing critique, uh, the book Adults uh, in a Room. Um, UK is now beyond the point where it can extend the transition period. Uh, many, of course, assume that, uh, that it won't, and there'll be no way of doing that outside of EU law, and that this is it. Um, it's, it's this year uh, or the cliff edge. Um, so where does the UK go from here? The European Union have said that the UK is not making compromises, um, and you have said on record that you would advise Boris to pursue no deal, uh, given that uh, there doesn't seem to be any alternatives available. Why do you think that? Well, let's set the record straight, straight uh, for the benefits of uh, full disclosure. I oppose Brexit. Uh, I campaigned against Brexit. Yeah. But as a Democrat, the day after Brexit won, I said to my fellow Remainers, I mean, my Remain position was ra rather weird in the sense that I was um, never, um, you know, um, uh, a cheerleader for Brussels and the EU. But my argument was a pragmatic one, given that you spent 45 years in it, um, in the European Union, you might as well stay and try to uh, clash with the Brussels establishment from within. But, you know, that's history now. Um, what I was trying to tell my fellow Remainers is, look, we lost the referendum, now let's uh, try to minimize the costs of Brexit. And for me, a Norway-style solution would have, would have been the best. But after the debacle in the previous parliament, um, Remainers did their best uh, through disrespecting levers, uh, effectively to, to secure a, a victory for Boris Johnson's hard Brexit. And once Boris Johnson won, um, against my better judgment, <laughs> I support the Jeremy Corbyn, as you know, but nevertheless, again, as a Democrat, we have to accept the, the verdict of the people and say, okay, Boris, you won your hard Brexit, do it. Um, beyond that, I have to say that th there have been, there's be, there've been developments that have made me rethink my position, uh, besides my democratic convictions. Uh, let me give you an example. Even after Brexit, I was arguing in favor of a Norway Plus solution because of companies like Nissan. My belief was that uh, the moment you have an interruption of supply chains with, with uh, checks on, you know, in, in Dover and so on, um, companies like Nissan would immediately divest from Britain and would shift production to Barcelona and Romania and so on. Uh, since this is a much bigger market, uh, you might as well shift to, you know, from the smaller market to the larger market. I was proven wrong. Nissan made it the exact opposite decision. It divested from Barcelona and Romania and from France and has announced massive investment in, in, in Newcastle. So, you know, um, I, I believe in, uh, in mea culpa in saying that I was wrong when I'm wrong. <laughs> um, beyond that, we have COVID-19. So, um, even though I was one of those people that predicted that the disruption in trade would be significant and unnecessary from a no-deal agreement. Well, now that we have COVID-19, uh, two things have happened. Firstly, uh, we've already had a huge hit. So, you know, whatever Brexit um, does to make things worse is going to be a tiny speck of uh, insignificance compared to what COVID-19 has done to, to, to trade and to production and to output and to income and to profits and to wages and so on and so forth. So, um, 
why get engaged in a very painful conversation with Brussels, with Mr. Bernier, um, you know, um, and make concessions that will take away the benefits from Brexit? Because I always could see that there are benefits from, from, Brexit, from Brexit. I just believe that the, the costs would be greater. Now that the costs have been suffered, I don't see why the, the benefits should be sacrificed. What benefits are we talking about? Look, don't believe the headlines that fish is important or, or that quotas are important or this, that, you know, labor standards or environmental standards. No, I think there is only one thing that is at issue here in the negotiations between London and Brussels. Competition policy. The right of London, of the UK government, to sustain and to support local industries. Right? That is the issue. It is an important issue from the European Union's point of view. The last thing that the European Union wants is a situation where Britain subsidizes uh, companies in the, United, in the United Kingdom to produce stuff, which then is dumped into the European Union's markets. Now, you can understand that Brussels is not happy with that. But there are ways of negotiating a deal um, maybe um, a, a silent deal uh, that, 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 that prevents that from happening. Uh, where I think the real game is, is in artificial intelligence and the technologies of the future, where government will have to take an important role in supporting those industries. The European Union is going to do it anyway. You see, this is the other thing that has changed. When Mr. Bernier tells London, you know, you've got to respect uh, the rules of the European Union, he's being disingenuous because the European Union is not any longer respecting the rules of the European Union. Uh, you, know, you know, you have Miss, Mrs. Vestager, who is um, a, a great stalwart supporter of competition policy, but she's being usurped within the European Union because now Mr. Macron and Mrs. Merkel, behind the, the, the back of EU functionaries, they make agreements on how to effectively provide state support to, Ameri to German and, 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 and French conglomerates. So the level playing field argument that, 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 that was valid before COVID-19 hit us is no longer valid. And therefore, I think that Boris Johnson must um, just, you know, just, just get through with this. Um, an agreement is going to be struck. Uh, it will be a flimsy agreement. It will be um, a minimalist agreement. Um, they will not allow themselves to say that this is a no-deal outcome. Um, it's, they will find a face-saving formula. And then uh, after Britain is formally out of the EU, uh, there will be new agreements that will follow through mm. as things evolve. And I think the, the real issue, I'll repeat myself, I uh, hope I'm not being too repetitive, but uh, I, I believe strongly that um, the, the, the outcome for Britain is going to depend on the capacity of this government, firstly, to design an effective industry policy, industrial policy, to support the technologies of the future within Britain, and to negotiate with the European Union a deal regarding those and not dumping, not dumping when it comes to labor standards, environmental standards, you know, just straightforward state aid. Well, on the subject of the harmonization of rules, I suppose, in the European Union, it might be a good segue now to discuss uh, the Eurozone. Um, and uh, on your visit to the Oxford Union in 2018, I was an audience member uh, at that point. You were meant to be debating, of course, Valdis Dombrovskis, the <laughs> Vice President of the European Commission for the Euro, who supposedly refused to debate you, and uh, you had to give a keynote speech. Um, and in that speech, you said, uh, you argued that the Euro has not only not made Europeans better off, uh, but it has inflicted a historic defeat upon European capitalism. So we wanted to ask you, was the Eurozone ever a sustainable construct? It could have been made sustainable. Mm. Uh, from the beginning, it could have been made sustainable at any point, if we added that which it is missing. I'm not against the idea of a common currency. I'm against the idea of a common currency that does not have the inbuilt shock absorbers and institutions which are necessary in order to make it a, a realm of shared prosperity. Um, so the main thing that's missing in the Eurozone is what I call a surplus recycling mechanism. Right? Let, let me give you an example with COVID-19. When the pandemic hit Britain, because Britain is a proper monetary union, right? 
Um, so what happened? What happened was people were locked into their homes, demand fell, in some places it fell more than in other places. Some places were hit a lot more by unemployment than other places. Um, so take Surrey, for instance, and you know Cumbria. Okay, so Cumbria was hit more harder, as it always is, <laughs> from any economic crisis than Surrey or Sussex. Okay, now imagine what would happen if the governor of Surrey, the governor, if there was such a thing, uh, of um, of Cumbria, you know, politicians from London all had to sit around the table to discuss how much money to transfer from Surrey to Cumbria or from shires or counties like Surrey to counties like Cumbria. It would, you know, all hell would break loose. There would be um, recriminations. The people from Surrey would say, we don't want our money to go to Cumbria. The people of Cumbria would say, yes, but without us, you would simply not exist, right? the whole union would be a complete mess, the whole thing would collapse. Now, this is exactly the kind of negotiation that happened after COVID-19 hit in the Eurozone. Yeah, they got together and they started discussing the so-called recovery fund, uh, the purpose of which was to send money from Germany and Holland to Italy and Greece or Spain. And the result was a complete, you know, nasty mess. And a mess which is not going to work even. Uh, because, you know, the beauty of the proper fiscal union like Britain or the United States or Australia for that matter, is that nobody had to have this discussion. What happened was Cumbrian unemployment went up further than Saris. The tax system immediately, automatically, without any meetings, without any discussions in parliament, effectively subsidized Cumbria by putting more burden on taxpayers in, in Sari. And nobody had to discuss this. This was an automated system, not a market system an automated political system, or what we call in economics, macroeconomics, the automatic stabilizers. The Eurozone doesn't have those. Now, people, you know, I've spent 20 years at least proposing mechanisms by which to introduce this surplus recycling mechanism in, in the Eurozone, but the standard answer we got every time we put forward these uh, proposals was nine, nine, and nine. <laughs> well, um that's actually uh, very pertinent to the next question I, I wanted to ask, which is about uh, your forecast for what will perhaps break up the euro, uh, and that is uh, Germany uh, refusing to bail out uh, perhaps the economies of, of the southern Europe you've, you've cited before Italy. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I'm sure you're familiar with it, the recent German constitutional court case at Karlsruhe, um, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, my German's not great, um, which held that the actions of the European Court of Justice and the European Central Bank were beyond the uh, scope of their powers in relation to the public sector purchase program, I think set up by the ECB in 2015, uh, to purchase national debt. So do you think that that episode perhaps represents the start of Germany's withdrawal perhaps from its commitment to the euro or do you think that the fragmentation of the euro will take a more stark form when Germany as you say just simply refuses to or doesn't wish to um, to bail out countries that, that need it? COVID-19 had the effect of um, putting all these discussions on hold for a very simple reason the German economy collapsed as well <laughs> along with Italy and the rest uh, it was impossible, even for German conservatives, to um, hold their own government to the debt break, to you know, the, the constitutional commitment of a balanced budget. So the German federal budget went into deficit, and therefore the um, political pressure to impose a balanced budget in Italy waned. Uh, they just decided that they can't even balance their budget next year. So that has bought more time for, for the Eurozone. But the problem is that they're not using this time. The European authorities are not using this time in order to build a system that can be politically resilient. Because look, the, the, in the end, it's a political decision. This is not an economic decision. There is no doubt that the European Central Bank can continue to finance Italian and uh, uh, 
Spanish and Greek deficits and, and, and debts uh, to the end of time. The question is political. When will the German political class pull the plug from the ECB? You mentioned the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. That was um, a preemptive strike. It was effect effectively a warning to the German political elite that we are not going, you're not going to have a green light from us forever. Uh, the question is, when are they going to pull the plug? Uh, or to put it differently, can they avoid pulling the plug forever? My answer to this question is no, because the lack of investment, both in Germany and in Italy, is creating a shortfall in the capacity of Europe, of continental Europe, to produce wealth. Moreover, that incapacity to produce wealth is asymmetric. Italy, every time there is a crisis in Europe, Italy falls behind Germany. You may recall or may have noted that before the Euro, Italy was catching up. Every year, Italian productivity was higher in terms of its growth to Germany's. Uh, but after the Euro, uh, it was exactly the opposite. And every time there's a crisis, Italy and Spain fall behind. Uh, and it's, if it's not public debt that rises to unsustainable levels, as in Italy, it's private debt, as in Spain. Um, so it seems to me that there will come a moment when globalization is going to have pushed sufficient, a sufficient number of German companies out of the Eurozone uh, so that they are no longer interested in maintaining the Euro. If you look at the large German conglomerates, most of their, their production is outside the Euro area now. So, you know, Siemens, Volkswagen, they produce in Mexico, in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, in China, um, increasingly with cars, um, you know, the, our, the production is going to be located in Vietnam or the batteries will be made in China. So the, the, uh, uh, the pressure to keep the Euro which is due to the fact that they need to have a constant exchange rate uh, with their main uh, um, factory bases, no longer will be valid. And when, so on the one hand, you are going to have, a, you know, savers. The, the average housewife in Swabia, the, the legendary Swabian housewife, who is putting some money into a nest egg or into a pension fund, which is now suffering because of negative interest rates, and who hates the euro as a result, more so than the Greeks or the Spaniards or the Italians do. That creates pressure in favor of the constitutional court that says to the Bundesbank, to the Central Bank of Germany, get out of the euro effectively. That's what they're telling them. So the pressure is going to be mounting against the euro within Germany, and the support of the euro is going to be waning. At some point, something is going to have to give. Um, look, allow me to say that, uh, you know, I've been visiting, as you know, I know Britain very well. I've been yeah. you know, in and out of Britain all my life. Um, and I know Germany quite well as well. And this is a, a hunch that I have, which I'm sharing with you. I can't prove it. But nevertheless, I think it's, it may, may, may be a significant hunch. And the hunch that I have, the feeling that I get when I'm in Germany these days, and I talk to bankers, financiers, industrialists, trade unionists, people on the street, it reminds me distinctly of Britain in 1992. Because 1992 was the moment when Euroscepticism set in. Most right, yeah. A process, you know, the roots of, of Brexit are then. 1991, 1992, with the collapse of the European exchange rate mechanism and Thatcher's uh, opposition to the ECB. The same kind of mumblings against the EU that I started hearing in 1992 in Britain, I can now hear in Germany. Mm. You mentioned there mounting problems, and of course, uh, what we are going to see, I'm sure, is mounting debt problems, uh, no doubt with countries across Europe, particularly putting forward significant spending commitments. Of course, in the UK, Rishi Sunak has rolled out stamp duty holidays, uh, very significant spending commitments for supposedly a fiscal conservative, and that, that's um, not going to be easy to, to square with perhaps the need for increase in, in taxes later down the line. Now, it wouldn't be an interview with Yanis Varoufakis were we not to ask you about austerity, um, which comes from 
the Greek, the ancient Greek, I believe, osteros, uh, meaning bitter and harsh taste. And I certainly think that that is the way in which, you know, it's been, it's been consumed by many people across Europe. And um, I suppose, firstly, why do you think that austerity uh, was or indeed is seen as so appealing by uh, the national governments of, of Europe? Um, and are you worried that with mounting debt, uh, levels of public debt, that the national governments will turn to, to the methods of austerity? Well, I'm worried about the, the Europeans, the European governments doing that, because it is um, something they've done so, so often before. It's um, um, it, 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 the path of least resistance uh, for inane governments. Um, you look at your deficits getting larger and you say, okay, I'm going to cut, cut down on spending and increase taxes. Um, that's, you know, it, it's exactly the same way that an inexperienced driver driving a rear wheel drive car, entering into a corner, you know, doesn't think of the rationality of opposite lock, right? That y your natural instinct is, is to turn the wheel in the wrong direction. Um, and that's exactly what has brought on austerity in the European continent. I'm not so worried about Britain. Um, this government seems to understand that austerity will be absolutely foolish. Uh, and look, I'm, as you know, I, I, I'm a leftist. So normally, under normal circumstances, I would very much like to see corporate tax go up. I would like to see corporations paying it, not just, in theory, having a high corporate tax. Um, but I'm not in favor of, of an increase in, in any kind of tax now in the United Kingdom. Why? Um, it's the wrong signal in the midst of this kind of depression. And let me be specific. Capitalism is no longer what it used to be. I've made this point in my introductory remarks, uh, and I used the 12th of August to signal this decoupling of the financial sector from the real capitalist economy, the world in which you know, people produce stuff and services. Uh, what is fascinating at the moment is that you have the highest level of share prices and the lowest level of dividends. Have you noticed that? So profitability is negative, okay? Profits are on the floor and share prices are on the ceiling. That's why I'm saying this is very weird. It's a very weird moment in capitalism. Um, I'm not going to go into analysis of that. We don't have the time for it. But taxation is a taxation on dividends. From a left-wing point of, of view, what you want to do during, you know, during the good times is tax profits. But there are no profits at the moment. Profits are negative in most areas of the economy, except for Google and Amazon, and that is hidden um, somewhere in the Caribbean via Holland, via Ireland, right? Um, if you could get your money on it, or your hands on it, fine. But you know, I don't think you can. I don't think the Chancellor of the Exchequer can. Um, so let's not worry about that. Let's worry about the real issue at hand, which is the fact that we have the greatest amount of liquidity in the history of capitalism, which is being wasted. It's not going into investment. So before you support any kind of policy, whether it's on taxation or whatever, ask yourselves a very simple question. Is this going to, whatever policy you are considering, is it going to increase investment in real stuff? in good quality jobs, especially, you know, in green technologies, in clean energy and so on. That is the question. I don't believe that increasing taxes or announcing that you are going to go into an austerian mode is going to do anything to turn the, this liquidity bubble into an investment drive. That's eminently reasonable. And I guess a quick quip on that is, on one hand, we do want the government to be able to fund a lot of these long-term productivity-centered modes of investment that go towards, as you said, Professor, real growth. On the other hand, they also need a stable enough credit ratings and presumably to some extent in the long or medium term independence from taking on excessive debt in order to sustainably do that, which is, I guess, why certain advocates of austerity would say, okay, you don't want to necessarily increase taxes, you don't want to print money because of the, the worries about inflation. You also don't want to constrict governmental spending elsewhere. So what then is the avenue for that sort of real growth to the extent that it's backed by the state or backed by 
credit that goes towards the public sector? Where exactly is the money going to come from? And how could that be sustained, say, over two to three years? Because presumably recovery is not going to be achieved within the next 12 months or so. And I was wondering what you'd make of that thought there. You see, the problem I have with advocates of fiscal discipline, with the Asterians, is that they are hypocritical. Mm. Uh, you know, they look to people like me and say, oh, you, again, you've invented the money tree. And I turn around and say, no, mate, you invented the money tree. You know, you didn't have a problem in the last 12 years while the Bank of England was printing mountain ranges of money, giving it to the banks to lend it to finances and the corporate sector. You didn't have a problem with that kind of thing. Did you, right? Not for a moment did you stop to think, is any of this money going to be invested in the real stuff? Um, so for me, money minting is happening. Money printing has never been grander in its scope and scale. Uh, and for me, the concern is how will this money not simply bid up asset prices, you know, mm. share prices, house prices in London, whatever, and how it would go into creating the, st the stuff that humanity needs and which capitalism even needs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that for me is the question. And let me be provocative by saying um, one thing we should have learned by now, especially after 2008, during the last 12 years, is that um, when you print a wad of money by which to refloat the economy or to help the economy, and you put between that wad of money and people out there, whether it's business, small business, or households, or whatever, you put between money and people, a commercial bank, most of that money is wasted. Because, you know, think about it. Let's say you're Barclays Bank, and I am the Bank of England, and I print a trillion, you know, a billion pounds today. And I call you up and say, um, would you like to borrow this money in order to lend it on? And I'll give you zero interest rate. Well, you know, there's no way you will say no. I'm giving you free money. Uh, and as long as you even can you charge even 0.1% interest rate, you know, you, it's, there's a carry trade to be made there. So you take the 1 billion pounds that I minted, okay? You're a backless bank now, and you think, okay, now, who am I going to lend it to? You're not going to lend it to any small business because you feel you won't get your money back in the, the current climate. You're not going to give it to people to buy a first home because you have no idea whether they will have a job tomorrow, okay? So what you'll do is, you, you, you know, there will, some, some large company is going to come along, or you will call them up and say, look, I have a billion, would you like to, to, to borrow it? That large company probably has savings already because it's too f fearful to invest. Uh, so it, 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 they ask you, okay, now what interest rate are you charging? You say, you know, well, 0.1%, 0.2%. Say, yeah, I'll, I'll have that, I'll have that. And you know what, what they do with it? Because they look around and they see the little people out there and they too think, like you, Barclays Bank, and they too think that the little people out there will not have enough money to buy their stuff. So they go straight to the London Stock Exchange and buy back their own shares with it. And you know, guess what? Their bonuses, the bonuses of the CEO and the board of directors is linked to the share price. The share price goes up, they make more money. Now, this money, the billion that the Bank of England has, has just printed, has been wasted. It hasn't gone into producing anything. This is what we should be worrying about. Huh? By increasing taxes, by trying to balance the, 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 the books of the banks. That's absolutely irrelevant. Mm. Take Nissan that I mentioned before. Yeah? The, take their decision making. They're somewhere in Japan and thinking, okay, how much money are we going to invest in Newcastle? Huh? Do they care what the, you know, the budget looks like of the British government? They don't give a damn. But what they care about is when they, it comes to deciding like, how many electric cars are we going to sell in Britain? There, they do care about the spending power of the British people. So if instead of the central bank, the Bank of England, giving one billion to Barclays to give it to a large company to buy back its own shares, you know, uh, you did something really simple, helicopter money. You know, you just put money into people's bank accounts. Put that billion, you know, equally, to everybody's bank accounts so that they can actually spend the stuff. Then maybe Nissan would actually invest in, <laughs> in, in Newcastle. And then the Chancellor of the Czech would actually tax this money because this money would go equally to poor people and rich people. Okay, The rich people's income 
if it increases as a result of this helicopter money, it can be taxed at a higher rate. So the chance to get some of the money back. I don't know if you're following my train of thinking, which is, is supposed to be extre extremely uh, impertinent and radical by some fiscal disciplinarians, but to me, it seems the only way to go forward. No, I, I certainly am, and I just wanted to apply this back to the Greek context, because Greece eventually did fold into accepting the bailouts from the IMF and EZB, and I was just wondering, do you think there was more that you now retrospectively, perhaps with benefit of hindsight, could have done politically in stopping that decision from happening? And as a follow-up to that, I suppose, do you think there's a debt crisis in Greece currently, or do you think that's a misnomer for really just underlying economic problems that you said just then have little to do with debt itself, but more to do with perhaps slow productivity and lack of real growth and, and also, which manifests, I guess, in high debt to GDP ratio, but it's not necessarily the root problem or debt is not the root problem per se in that sense. No, debt is a symptom. Um, yeah. I made that point when I was at Oxford giving my talk there that you kindly invited me to give. Um, I'll, so I'll, I'll start by answering the second part of the question before I go to the first one. Um, the, the debt was a symptom. It was a, a symptom of a badly designed monetary system. Um, to put it simply, if Greece was not in the euro, you would never have heard of a Greek crisis because it just wouldn't have been a Greek crisis. Maybe Greece would have been you know, like Bulgaria, um, a, you know, quasi sad, quasi happy, um, sluggish, quasi-corrupt economy, but we would not have had a slump and we would not be littering the headlines of every newspaper in the world for 10 years. <laughs> um, and if we had never entered the euro in the year 2001, uh, Deutsche Bank, Ben Paribas and so on would not have led so much money to the Greek states and to the Greek banks uh, and then there wouldn't be such a collapse and then there wouldn't be these huge bailouts, blah, 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 blah. So. Uh, my answer is clear on this. It's a badly designed monetary system which uh, um, crashes, and then when it crashes, it leaves behind legacy public and private debts that can never be repaid. Uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, by the way, allow me to make a small correction to what you said. Greece did not buckle. It was my prime minister who buckled. So the Greek people, um, with an astonishingly courageous 62% uh, verdict in the referendum of the 5th of July of 2015, said no. Uh, it was the political class that um, betrayed the, the, the public. And that's one of the reasons why I was so sensitive after the Brexit referendum not to treat the winners of the referendum with, with contempt, close parenthesis. Uh, what did I do wrong? What would I have, have, have done differently with hindsight? I would have been far more diplomatic with the Troika, and I would have pulled the plug in the negotiations in February instead of waiting until our capitulation in July. Great. And could you tell us more, uh, back to the present, I suppose, about the new party you founded in 2018, um, Mera 25, and, and how do you think it could gain traction, especially in light of the COVID pandemic and, and frankly, the, the quagmire and difficulties that the country is currently undergoing? And given how divided and electorates are all over Europe, do you think it's feasible for your movement at large within the European Parliament, uh, including... Uh, DEM 25, to bring about a European identity that's both progressive and also capable of articulating a vision that captures voters' imagination outside Greece and across Europe. Look, the fact that we even exist in Parliament, that we managed to get into Parliament in Greece, is uh, a feat. And it is a feat because, in, you know, it's not easy for populations, whether they are Greeks, Brits, French, whatever, to get mobilized politically and to start believing that politics, you know, through their voter can change stuff. Uh, in, in, in the referendum of 2015, um, about a million Greeks, that's a tenth of the population, actually it's uh, one sixth of the voting population, uh, voted for the first time because they believed that, look, this is an opportunity to actually make a difference. And the next day they were told, nope, your vote counts for nothing. They, so they went back home. And this is a problem with liberal democracies that most people don't believe in them. They go and vote um, without hope. They vote for you know, the least bad party without much hope. Uh, and after 2015, people like myself and those who wanted to stand their ground against the Troika, um, who, you know, I had a, a very serious difficulty, both in Britain and in, the, in Greece. 
how to put forward an argument that is not black and white, that is not, you know, uh, oversimplistic. So, for instance, when I was in Britain campaigning against Brexit, I was, it was very difficult not to, to be a cheerleader of the EU at the same time, to say, look, the EU sucks, but you, you must stay in it. That's a very difficult argument to make. And similarly with, within Greece. So, you know, the Troika cheerleaders in Greece present me as an anti-European monster. Many of the left present me as a stooge of the European Union because I'm not advocating that we should leave the European Union. Uh, and it's so very easy when you have all the media in a place like Greece uh, effectively surviving, financially surviving, through the largesse of banks that are bankrupt, which in turn survive through the largesse of the European Central Bank. And a party that takes a position against the European Central Bank, against the media, you know, we get zero airtime in the media. Never, never do they mention anything about us unless it's vilification. Uh, so the fact that we got in is a good thing. The fact that we got in the European Parliament elections about one and a half million votes across Europe, uh, which is a very small number as a percentage of the total European population, but nevertheless, we had, you know, 60,000 pounds to spend across Europe. You know, that's nothing. <laughs> uh, and a local government election costs more than that. Uh, am I optimistic? No, I'm not. But then again, who cares? Because, you know, um, the, the most important political changes and transformations uh, did not happen because people predicted it would succeed. They happened because people believed that they, they should happen and they continued to struggle for them, uh, come what may. You know, so when in the 1800s, um, some romantics gathered in London forming the anti-slavery society, were they optimistic that they would succeed? Probably not. You know, slavery had never been banned in the, in the history of the world before that. But, you know, we have to keep trying and we are trying and it's fun trying. Professor Varoufakis, um, conscious of time, so we'll make this the final question. You've just said there that um, you're not optimistic. You've said this before in an interview with the New Statesman in May. I um, wanted to take you back to the start of your career when you were writing books, you were lecturing economics at universities, and you were trying to, I think, teach people um, and, and help widen access to an understanding of the economy. You, you've long said that we cannot leave the economy to the economists and we need to understand the ideas that, that shape it. Um, so as a final question, I suppose, how do we, especially at this very interesting moment in, in, in global history, um, encourage discussion about difficult subjects related to the economy uh, and politics? And how do we widen participation in that discussion? Can you ever be optimistic? Well, I, I, as you know, I make a distinction between being hopeful and being optimistic. Hope yeah. never dies even in the bleakest of moments, but optimism is a very, very poor cousin of hope. Uh, I think that, look, the, the, your question is, is a big question that humanity always faced, mm. um, and which it had to answer in order to make progress. Mm. How do we uh, maintain a critical engagement with reality, um, being sensible and at the same time being visionaries? You're, you, know, you need a realistic utopia constantly mm to inform your thinking. A utopia which is realistic and a realism which is not dystopic but utopic. Uh, and, you know, through discussion, through honest, genuine, unmotivated discussion. Discussion which is only motivated by a search for truth and a search for, um, mm. for weaknesses in one's own arguments. Um, the only thing that has ever really strengthened me in my life is, to, you know, people that have pointed out the flaws in my thinking. These are the greatest allies. We have to look for them. We live in a society that tries to ban them, uh, you know, to just um, uh, ostracize them, to, ex to, to, to expunge them. And I think it's important uh, not to, uh, and to engage with them. Uh, you mentioned that I was writing books. I still do. Um, yeah. uh, allow me to plug my next book, which is coming out <laughs> in London, and in a place near you in Oxford uh, yeah. on the 10th of September by the Bobby Head Penguin. It's called Another Now. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is because um, I was trying to answer your question. How do I motivate a discussion mm -hmm. on uh, um, what the world could look like 
and you know what a realistic utopia may, may be like mm. and how far are we prepared to go to bring it about so i sat down and i wrote a piece of um political science fiction so another now is coming out on the 10th of september it's an is an attempt uh to just imagine that mm. what could have happened after 2008 to bring about a completely different world to the one we have and to what extent would we make sacrifices in order to bring it about, about. So science fiction comes in there. Brilliant, so the counterfactual. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure that that, uh, that book will accrue many readers. And um, uh, Professor Varoufakis, we we've covered a lot of ground today. Extremely grateful for your participation in this discussion. So thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, thank you. Wonderful.